You know, through uh, this series, we really wanted to take a moment and focus on the virgin birth of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I pray that you take a moment today, sometime with your family, to pause and to recognize who he is and what he means not only to the world, but what he means to you as you experience the power of Christ in Christmas. If you're new with us, we've been talking about worship this Christmas, and the title of our series has been Come to Worship, and it's based on a text in uh, Matthew chapter 2. We can look there real quick. Uh, the next slide. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, the Magi, or the wise men from the east, came to Jerusalem, and they asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw a star when it rose, and we have, say it with me, come to worship him. And that is the title of our series that we've been teaching on. And in this series, we looked at four different postures of worship. In that first week, we looked at the, the posture of worship of raising up holy hands to God. And for many of you, that was the first time you did it. Uh, the second week, we, looked about, we talked about bringing our gifts to God as an act of worship. Last week, we looked at pouring out our hearts to God in praise for his faithfulness as a posture of worship. And last week was awesome, and I heard a lot of feedback from you about that. It really moved. I was excited to preach it, and I was excited to hear the way that it it impacted you as well. Today, what I want to do is I want to talk to you about bowing your knees, kneeling before God in the act of surrender and in worship. I want to start today with a portion of the Christmas story in Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 10 and 11. And this is when the wise men actually experienced Christ. The story goes like this. When the wise men saw the star, they were overjoyed. King James Version says it this way, they they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. What a way to compound joy upon joy upon joy. They rejoiced with exceeding great joy, or they were overjoyed. Now, why were they overjoyed? Because literally, for centuries upon centuries, they were hoping, they were praying, they were believing that one day God would send a Messiah, the Savior of the world. And the wise men believed that this was the moment, this was the sign that they were looking for. Verse 11 says, On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother, Mary. And what did they do, church? Let's say this aloud. They bowed down and they worshipped him. They bowed down and they worshipped him. Now, what's interesting, and most of the time when we picture this, we visualize, we visualize Wise men bowing down to this two-week or two-day-old or four-day-old or maybe even a two-week-old baby, whatever. And, 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 and why do we do that? And, and we do that because those Christmas cards we get that have the nativity scene on it, right, has all the players in place at the time of Jesus' birth. But, and this is what we've been talking about for the last few weeks, In reality, scholars believe that Jesus was not a baby when the wise men actually got there. Chances are he was a toddler, right around two years of age. Remember, they traveled 900 miles. And according to what we see in Scripture, Jesus was probably two years of age. Have you ever wondered what Jesus would be like in his twos? Right? Could you tell Jesus terrible twos? What was he like when he was a tween, right? Not quite middle school, not quite high school. I wonder what he was like during then. These are questions I think about. But when the wise men, they were bowing down, they were bowing down to a two-year-old, and that completely amazes me. To be waiting for the coming Messiah, to follow a star 900 miles, and then to look at a two-year-old. And to say, I worship you. I have come to worship you. Now I want to talk 
today about kneeling in the presence of God, and really we need to call it for what it is, right? In our culture, most of you are not going to go, oh, kneeling? Let me go ahead and do that right now for you. Our culture isn't used to kneeling. It's like, it's like lifting your hands, right? Uh, it's, it's, a lot of us did that for the very first time as an act of worship, and it definitely pushed us out of our comfort zone. Guys, I, I think about men, and I think there's probably two times in life that you plan on kneeling, right? First of all, you kneel in proposal to your wife, amen? Right, and there's a big, there's a big that's awesome. You kneel for a reason, and that's because you're going to get married. Right to someone who who's actually saying yes to you. Okay, so that's a a reason why we'll. Another reason we kneel is because we're getting a football picture taken. Right. So, did you just put that up, or has that been up for a while? Okay, good. All right. So uh, you can see, I was still a husky boy then too. All right. So, but uh, so that's and that's the reason why guys probably kneel to get married, and because we're posing for a football picture. I wonder. Ladies, I, you know, I really, I guess, you know, I grew up with all boys, so I never, you know, is there a, a moment of kneeling for late? I don't think so, but, or maybe, do you take football pictures? I have no idea. Okay. Culturally speaking, most of us don't go around kneeling. It's kind of like, I don't know, it, 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 the, culturally speaking, th- this isn't even really normal anymore, but praying in public, Right. Um, we, we pray, my wife and I, and when we eat out at a restaurant, it doesn't matter if it's KFC or if it's Applebee's, uh, when we're together, we pray out loud. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little loud, like, like I, I make sure people around me hear that we're praying, um, and I pray for them, um, which is a little awkward. Uh, but not as much as my friend Jason Fields. I got a good friend who lives down in Florida, Jason Fields. We went to school together. And he was an evangelist prayer person. He would, like, we would go to Taco Bell, and he would be like, Dear Jesus, we come before you, our Lord and Savior, who died for our sins. And he would pray really loud. And uh, people would be getting saved at Taco Bell. But, um, uh, and I'm, 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 not, I'm not that loud. But, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely not the norm, right? I, I know it's not the norm. We did it just the other night. We were down in the Poconos. And we went to a fast food restaurant, a fast food restaurant, and we just sat there and we prayed. And I could, I could see out of the corner of my eye this, this, these two girls. They just, they stopped. They just were, they just looked at us like we were aliens, you know. Um, and afterwards, as they were leaving, they just came by and they tapped us on the shoulder, and they're just like, "God bless you guys." And I, and I knew the reason why. There's no reason for them to stop and say that except for my loud prayer that I did in Kentucky Fried Chicken. Um, and it was, it was countercultural, and it was different. So when you look at God's word, you're going to see over and over again opportunities to kneel down in humble submission and awe to the goodness of God. In Psalm 95, verses 6 and 7, the psalmist speaks to us and says this. He says, come let us, and let's say this all aloud this Christmas, come let us bow down in worship and kneel before the Lord our maker let us bow down in worship let us kneel before the Lord our maker because he is our God and we are the people of his pasture the 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 flock that is under his care come let us bow down in worship and let us kneel before the Lord God our maker now this is an interesting Hebrew word that actually is translated as worship and the word is shaka say that with me ready shaka okay not to be confused with shaka khan okay and some of you who were raised in the 80s you knew about shaka khan and if you missed and you have no idea what i'm talking about let it go by you okay all right shaka this word is used 170 times in the bible and what this word means is it means to bow down low to kneel in worship. It doesn't just mean worship, but inside this word is the posture of kneeling in worship. And 170 times in scriptures, we are told in his word to kneel before God and to worship. Now, one of the reasons why I believe culturally that we don't kneel more often is because fundamentally we don't understand and comprehend the holiness of God. 
I want you to think about that. Culturally, the reason why we don't kneel before God in worship is probably because we don't understand or comprehend the holiness of God. You see, if we, if we understood just how holy God is, then we would want to be low before Him in worship. So holy is God that mortal man cannot look upon Him in His essence and being and live. I want you to think about Moses, right? You know the story about Moses. Moses wanted to see the glory of God. And God said, you can't handle my glory. I'll pass by you, but you need to cover your face. You can only see just a tail, just a glimpse of me when I pass by. Because you cannot look upon my face and live. That is the holiness of God. I want you to turn to Exodus chapter 33 and verse 17. Go ahead and turn there. Exodus chapter 33, and we're going to look at this story of Moses. It is a wonderful story. Exodus chapter 33, and we're going to start in verse 17. And I want to show you in Scripture how Moses himself, a friend of God, could not look at God directly. Verse 17 says this, And the Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses says, Please, show me your glory. And he said, I, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will, gra I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I show mercy. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live because of his holiness. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you should stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take my hand away, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. A holy God. A holy God. Sinful man. Sinful man. Let, let me just say this. God doesn't sweep the sins of the world underneath the rug. He deals with them in a holy and righteous way. He deals with them in a holy and righteous way. That's the shedding of blood. See, in the Old Testament, they had mediated access to God. Go ahead and pull up that slide of the tabernacle. It looks like it's a blueprint, okay? Mediated access to God because of His holiness. See, God wants to be with us. He created us. He loves us. But our sin separates us from God. And so in the Old Testament, what God did is he created an environment of worship called the sanctuary, the tabernacle, the tent. Okay, he made an environment of worship. This was mediated access to God. God made a way for us to have access to him. Because we have sin, we're separated from God. We can't be in his presence. And so he came up with a way for us to have access to him. This is mediated access. So families would come to the courtyard and, and, and they would, they would want to be in the worship of God. They wanted to have access to God and through the priest and through the sacrifice, right? They were, their family was, had the ability to have access to God. But more specifically, so the families met in the courtyard and they went through what is described in the law, right? They went through all the sacrifices to get right before God. And then the priest, the high priest, he would then go into a place called the holiest of holies. Go ahead and transfer to the next to the next slide. So the high priest then would go into this inner tent. Okay, no one else was allowed access to this. The priest would go into this inner tent, and then they would actually tie a rope to his leg because sometimes he would die. And they would have to pull him out. So holy is God that mortal man cannot look upon him in his purest essence and live. Now, I, I, I just want to tell you, this is, it's good that we know this, but I, I, want you, I want you to know this. Christ replaces 
that whole system. Christ, and it was a good system, right? But it, it fell short. It fell short. Christ replaces all of that, right? Communities, families would go to this place, and it would be an environment of worship. Praise God, when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit dwells within you, right? And you are the place of worship. There is no mediator between God and man except for the person, Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen? That's free. That's not even part of the notes. That's just added, okay? We have Christ. He is our mediator, and he gives access. When we start to comprehend God, the glory of God, the one who spoke and created everything, the holiness of God, I want you to catch this. Suddenly, kneeling down before him seems like the right thing to do. Right? When, when, when we think about and when we comprehend and when we understand that God is holy, kneeling down before him is the right thinking. It's the right posture of worship. Here, here's something interesting. I couldn't find a single place in the Bible where God commands us to bow before him. Right? There's no, thus saith the Lord, bow down before me. God does not tell us to bow down before him because I feel it's assumed. It's assumed because of who he is and what he's done for us. I want you to think about this. God doesn't tell us to bow down. The only thing he says is for us don't to bow down to someone else, right? Don't bow down to false idols. Don't uh, bow down or put any other gods before me. And I think the reason why he doesn't tell us or command us because I think it's assumed that when we know who he is, we'll want to kneel before him and worship. Come let us bow down and worship before our God. Let us kneel before the Lord God our maker. This morning I want to do, uh, and this is what I want, I want to inspire you to come to worship and to come to worship him this morning. Not just to worship a church, but to let your life be full of worship to God, to lift up holy hands every now and then uh, before Him, to bring your gifts as an act of worship, to pour out your hearts to Him in worship, and every now and then, right, or perhaps often, we get down on our knees. Maybe we get a little lower than we used to. Maybe we get down on our face and we say, God, I want there to be less of me and I want there to be more of you. I want there to be less of me, and I want there to be more of you, and I want to worship you. What better time this see, this Christmas when we would pause in the middle of all the hustle and bustle in this world and think about the birth of Christ. That God so loved the world that he became one of us. Not born in a palace, but in a hole in the wall, in a manger to symbolize that he's not too far-reaching that he came for the lowest of lows. Based on who he is and what he did, sometimes our only reasonable response is to bow and to worship him. Here's a question. When was the last time you bowed before God in worship? What I want to do is to help you along and give you three different reasons why we might want to bow. Three different reasons why, and you can take notes. If you're taking notes, you can fill in the blanks that we have there. The first one is this. Some of you, you might want to kneel in pursuit. We want to kneel in pursuit. In Mark's gospel, in the 10th chapter, there's a really interesting story about a very rich young guy. He had everything that everybody would think that they needed, and yet he was missing something, and he knew it. And so the story goes in verse 17, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him. And what did this guy do? Say it with me. He fell on his knees before Jesus. And he said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, I want to be honest with you. I probably taught this passage of scripture and the question over a dozen times publicly. I've studied this passage and I have taught 
uh, on the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Tons of time. But really never looking at this young man's posture when he asked this question. He fell on his knees before Jesus, and he says, good teacher, what must I do? Some of you, you may right now be in a place that in your life you're not committed to be a God follower, and you know it. And you may believe in God, but he's not the sole pursuit of your heart. You're not a fully devoted follower of Jesus. Some of you, like this rich young man, you may not even know what you believe. You're questioning, is there a God? Could there be a God? If there is a God, what, how does Jesus fit in with other religions and all these things? And that's a good, you're in a good place to investigate that. And I want to encourage you that the, if that's you, here's what you might do, just like this rich young man, you might decide that uh, this is pretty important. You say, well, I, I, I don't want to miss this, therefore I'm going to kneel. I don't even know if I'm kneeling to God I believe in. I don't even know who he is, but I'm going to kneel just in case, and I'm going to ask some questions because I'm pursuing. I'm pursuing. You might kneel in pursuit and pray something along the lines, God, if you're really there, please show me. If it's really you, reveal yourself to me. How many of you at some point in time in your life, you have prayed that prayer in pursuit? God, I need, I need, if you, if you are real, you need to make yourself known to me. You prayed that prayer. Let me just warn you, as a person has prayed that prayer one time in my life before, that when you pray something like that, you better get ready for God to answer. You better get ready for God to answer that. Well, how can I say that? Because Scripture says when you draw near to God, what does He do? He draws near to you. When you draw near to God, when you're in pursuit of God, listen, He will always return to pursuit and return to you. Because when you draw near to God, He draws near to you. So there may be some of you at this point, you're saying, you know what? This is a pretty serious thing. I'm going to kneel in pursuit just like this rich young ruler did. I don't know the answers, but I'm pursuing them. There are others of you, you're a follower of Jesus, and you don't necessarily need to kneel in pursuit, but you may need to kneel in repentance. You may need to kneel in repentance. You see, every now and then, sometimes often, we do things that really break the heart of God. We hurt others. We hurt our own lives. And I tell you, and I don't know why, but during Christmas time, it becomes painfully obvious, and there's a lot of pain. It's a magnifier. If you've done something against someone directly against God or directly against someone you love, this time magnifies the weight of that sin, and you just can't get it off your mind. It's a magnifier. Some of you right now, you may be smiling on the outside, but you're grieving on the inside because you've done something to hurt someone that you love deeply. And there's a powerful example of kneeling in repentance when we look at Luke's gospel in the fifth chapter. Peter was a fisherman. He was fishing all day long, and he didn't catch anything. Jesus comes up to him, and he says, Hey, why don't you throw the net on the other side of the boat? <clears throat> now, you got to be thinking about Peter, right? Peter's a fisherman. Jesus is a carpenter, right? Say it with me. Peter is a fisherman, and Jesus is a, and Jesus yells from the shore, Hey, why don't you try throwing that net on the other side? So I don't know how long the boat is, right? How, how wide is a boat? Four feet? Ten feet? Let's say it's a 20-foot long wide boat, okay? So Peter's like, okay, let me just get this straight. I'm fishing over here, and you want me to start fishing over on this side. And I'm going to start catching fish. Where are like the fish like little geniuses in the water, right? Are they like, hey guys, he's over there. Come on this side of the boat. Right? I've watched enough uh, TV shows like Deadliest Catch to know you're either in a hot spot or you're not. Right? You're either, you're either catching fish or you need to go somewhere else. I'm a, and by the way, I'm a terrible fisherman, just so you know. <sighs> So what does Peter do? Well, Peter says, 
All right, I'll give it a try. I'll do it. So he goes to the other side, and he tosses the nets over the other side. You know what happens. There's so many more fish. He catches so so many fish. It's so many fish, the nets start to break. Suddenly, you know, I, I, I can just imagine, suddenly he looks up and he looks at the guy who told him to do that and he's like, oh, I didn't know it was you. Right? Oh. Now, what's his response? Verse 8. Look at verse 8. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, what did he do? Let's say it all aloud. What did he do? He fell on his knees before Jesus in an act of repentance. In an act of repentance. How do I know that? Well, because he doesn't say, oh, I worship you, that you're so good, give me more fish. He doesn't say that. What does he say? He says this, oh, Lord, please leave me. I'm too much of a sinner to be around you. That, my friend, is a repentant prayer. Am I right? That is a repentant prayer. And here's the beautiful thing. This is beautiful. Jesus never turns away a sinner with a repentant heart. Jesus never turns away a sinner with a, with a repentant heart. He never does. Some of you right now, you, you're surprised you're even in church this morning, right? You thought, if I go to church on Christmas, the roof is going to fall in. Listen, our roof is fine. It doesn't matter how bad you are. It doesn't. It doesn't matter how bad you are. You belong in the presence of God with a repentant heart. Amen? Oh, I'm going to say that again. You belong in the presence of God with a repentant heart. Amen? It's true. It's true. It's painfully true. Jesus never turns away anyone who comes to him and says, I've fallen or I fell. Listen, Peter fell. He, Peter fell. And Peter was a bad dude. Peter was a bad guy. But he falls on his knees and repents. And Jesus says, guess what? From now on, you're not just going to be fishing for fish. You're going to be fishing for men. You're going to be fishing for men. So here's where, where, so here's where we see him kneeling down in repentance. And there will be some of you that you're going to need to kneel down. And you're going to need to get low and say, I've sinned against you, God. I've sinned. Here's the good news. Scripture teaches us that when you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. In the song that we've sung like three times this Christmas season, which is great, Oh Holy Night, there's a verse that says, Fall on your knees. Fall on your knees. So you might collapse and you say, God, I've done something wrong. Will you forgive me? Will you forgive me? And in that moment, You'll experience the grace of God and you may want to stay on your knees for a little bit while and worship him a little bit more because he freely he freely forgives you. Some of you are going to want to kneel in pursuit. Some of you are going to want to kneel in repentance. And there's some of you who are going to want to kneel in submission. You can write that down. Submission. Maybe for the first time in your life or maybe in a particular area where you won't let go because you want to control it, today you're going to kneel down in submission. Now I'm going to confess this. I, uh, <laughs> and, and it's going to bother some of you. It is going to bother you. Uh, and I know a pastor shouldn't, but I do. But I love UFC fighting. I do. I do, Jamie. I know you hate it. I know you hate it. But I love watching fighters fight. I really do. And... Um, I like it better than boxing because not just punching, you can throw kicks and jabs and what they call submission, right? So there's certain moves that they can inflict on someone where someone might pass out or their arm might get really, really hurt, okay? And before it does that, before a person falls out or before a person really gets badly hurt, the person has an opportunity to tap, right? Or to say, you know, uh, I submit. Or they, they never say that. They either tap or they pass out. That's what happens, okay? Um, and let me just say this. If you like UFC, God bless you. You're forgiven too. Jesus never turns away a repentant sinner. Amen? Okay. All right. 
So I, I, love, to, I love to wrestle and tickle my boys, okay? I, lo- I love it. There's certain Saturday mornings when we're able to kind of sleep in a little bit. They'll jump in bed, and th- I, th- they just want to wrestle, and they want to tickle. They ju- it, it's just our thing, and we do it, and they giggle, and we love their giggle, and it's great. But, um, and they're both tough, and they, they try to beat up the old man, right? So as they're growing up, they're, they're, they're trying to they're trying to ex- ex- exalt their will on me, but I won't let them do it. I won't ever let them win, okay? Because uh, I'm a good dad, all right. So, um, and and I'll do mean stuff too. I'll, I'll do stuff like I did to my little brother when he was younger. But I'll do stuff. I'll like wrap their arms around them and I'll and I'll grab it by one hand so that I have a free hand. They have no free hand. And then I'll just start tapping their forehead or something like that, right? I'll just keep just tapping it, just like a water dripping right on their forehead, right? And it'll just keep bothering them. And then after a while, they start squirming around. Then they start screaming, and, ah, ah, dad, stop! Okay, I know it's terrible. I'm a terrible guy, but. Um, but so, so, sometimes I'll make them say a statement Like I'll be like Say dad's the greatest Tell me dad's the greatest Or tell dad he's Mr. Incredible I, I, I know it's very selfish But I do that it, it, It's my way they, they don't say tap They just say one of these things And uh, let me just say this And I, I didn't even expect them to all be in here But let me JJ is the toughest Okay, okay So Alright He is th- th- That kid won't tap Right He'll pee his pants before he taps all right, and and like I'll, I'll sit there and I'll be I'll be I'll be choking down. Now listen, I don't choke my kids out, okay? But uh, right, so I'll, I'll pin them down and I'll be like, "Say, Dad's the greatest," and he'll look at me and he'd be like, "Mommy's the greatest." And I'll be like, "What?" You know, and I'll be like, "Say it, say it. I want you to say it." And they'd be like, "Say, Dad's the greatest." Maybe he'd be, "I'm the greatest." I'd be like, "Son, I'm like, you're. I'm about to break your arm. Like, tell me who the greatest is." And then finally, you know, he'll wet his pants. All right, so. <laughs> So what? So, so so this is what this is what's crazy to me. Th- th- this is what's crazy. They're all denying. I don't wet my pants. Okay. There's some of us. Okay, and I, I'm including myself in this. There's some of us that we're like that with God. We're like that with God. There's there's some area in our life where we just won't tap. I want it this way. I want it my way. Listen, there's some of us. God has been reaching out to us for years and we won't tap and we won't surrender to his plan, which is far better than our plan, by the way, but we won't do it. And we won't kneel and we won't surrender. See, it, it, it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily the act with the knees. It's, it's what's going on in the heart that we won't kneel and we won't surrender. What's crazy is is that Jesus did this himself. Je- Jesus surrendered. We're, Jesus, who was born of a virgin in a, in a manger, and he was born to die. And I want you to think about that statement, he was born to die. Jesus, being God in the flesh, knew what was coming ahead. He knew what was coming. He never sinned against God, and yet he knew the agony that he would face because of sin. He knew the agony that he had to face because of sin. Everything that we've done wrong, that's what he became. So much so that God turned away from him, and he faced the terror of dying on the cross without the presence of his Father who had sustained him through everything. Jesus understood this was coming and that he did this in this moment. Luke 22, verses 41 and 42, he says this, Jesus withdrew. He was with the disciples in the garden, and he withdrew about a stone's throw beyond the disciples. And what did Jesus, the Son of God, do? He knelt down and he prayed. He got down on his knees and he prayed. And what did he pray? I want you to say it all out of me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. Some of you, that's what we need to pray today. We need to tap. Not my will, but your will be done. I surrender to you. You know, we all know those people who have tremendous amounts of faith, right? And sometimes you look at those people and they've gone through terrible things. But man, they're so strong. And their faith is so loud. And, and, and you ask them, Sometimes, if you get bold enough, you ask them, you say, how, 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 how do you stay so strong? How do you do it? 
How do you keep going in the midst of so much opposition? Those strong people of faith, I, I, I know this because I know a couple of them, they would all say this, kneeling to pray is what gives you strength to stand. Let me just say this. Most of those people are prayer warriors. They're prayer warriors. And they would say this, kneeling to prayer will give you strength to stand. It's their sword. It's their power base. Some of you, it's time to lift up holy hands before God, to bring our gifts, to pour out our hearts. Maybe for you, a new and very worshipful, surrendered, submissive posture of worship and awe before God is to literally kneel down before Him. Come, let us kneel before our God and worship Him, the Lord God, our Maker. Now, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. We wrote this down in your notes. Are you ready? Scripture says this, you can kneel now or you're going to kneel later. You can kneel now or you're going to kneel to Him later. You can kneel now in pursuit, in repentance, in submission, and in worship. Or one day, when it's not your choice, you'll kneel then. Because this is what Scripture teaches us. And I want you to take a look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. And being found in the appearance as man, Jesus, why was he born? Okay, he was born, he put on flesh to humble himself, become obedient to death, even to the death of a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus say it with me every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under earth and every tongue acknowledge the good news the reason why we celebrate Christmas today I want you to say this last part with me that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory God the Father. Our God never asked us to bow before Him because He knew that when we knew who He was, our only reasonable response would be to bow down and to worship Him. He is a holy God. And I, at this Christmas time of the year, I want to give you a chance to bow down and to worship. Matt, if you go ahead and make your way up this way and this morning, after this song, okay, this morning after the song, and I've asked Matt, there's been a couple of songs that's been in my head as I've been studying for this. Come let us worship, right? What a great song. And, I, and there's also another one that's going to be very familiar to you, and you're going to love it, and we're going to sing it. But if you're moved to bow down afterwards, and when we pray as a we pray as a church afterwards, and we do a call to change, if you're moved to bow down, please do this. Maybe you can't physically, and that's fine. Listen, I understand that. Maybe there's not enough space in between the pews, and, it, and I, I take up a lot of room when I bow down too, right? So I get it. Listen, if you can't physically bow down, that's fine, but remember what we said earlier, submission, okay, is, is not so much the act of kneeling, but it is the heart that is surrendering towards God. And maybe, maybe for you, listen, you're not going to do it here, and I understand that. But later on today, would you bow down before him? Would, would, would you go in your living room, put a pillow underneath your knees if you need to? Okay, it may take you a half hour to get down. I get that. All right. Or to get back up. I, someone said that to me, or to get back up. Okay. This is between you and God. But don't let this posture of worship pass you by. It's an important one. And we've come to worship. And he's worthy of our worship. Amen. How about we do this? Would you all stand with me? Let's sing this song, and then afterwards we'll close off in a moment of prayer. A call to change. Taking the time that we spent today examining Scripture, being moved by the presence of the Holy Spirit, walking away from here changed into the image of Jesus Christ. Let's put on Christ this morning. Father, we thank you so much for who you are and for what you did for us. 2,000 years ago. For centuries, people anticipated the birth of the Messiah, and now we look back and we celebrate who He is, what He did for us on the cross, and what it means for us that we can glorify You today. God, we thank You for that You're so holy that You give us the chance to bow down and to worship You. 
God, during this Christmas, we just want to take a moment to recognize this amazing truth of the grace that you have for us and that you've come to earth through the virgin birth, your son Jesus born to die so that we can live. God, because of that, we worship you. And as you take a moment to pray, some of you are going to recognize in your life that it's time to kneel down and surrender to him. There may be an area of your life that you're trying to control, something that you're not willing to tap, and you recognize, I need to let this go. I'm trying to have my will, but I need to surrender it and say, God, not my will, but I trust for yours to be done. Those of you who would say, yes, there's an area that I've been trying to control, and either symbolically or even physically today, I choose to kneel before God. I want to let go of my control, and I want to trust him and his perfect will for, for my life. I kneel by faith, and I surrender before him. If that's you today, no one's looking around. It's important that this doesn't happen. Please, no one looking around. But would you lift up your hands right now and say to him, I surrender to him in this way. Raise your hands. I surrender to him. Thank you. And in that holy moment, he's doing a work in our hearts and in our church and all over the world. And I pray this, God, that your Holy Spirit would work in us, that there would be less of us, God, and more of you. Just like Jesus in the garden when he prayed not to physically endure the same and the pain on the cross, he surrendered kneeling in prayer before you to your perfect will. God, give us the ability to do that in our hearts today. Not what we want, God, but we kneel before you and surrender saying, we want what you want. As you keep praying, we talked about other reasons that we might kneel. We would kneel in pursuit of God. We might kneel in repentance. There's some of you today that you're going to recognize that if you look at your posture of your heart symbolically, you have never, not just physically, but symbolically, you've never knelt before God. And please don't miss the power of this Christmas that God recognized that you were separated from him by our sins and that the only way that we could be forgiven is that a perfect person would die in our place. God, we thank you that you sent Jesus who was born of a virgin, not inheriting the sin nature of an earthly father so that he could live the perfect life and die the perfect death for all of our imperfections, all of our sins on the cross. This morning, there's some of you, you're going to recognize that you've never knelt in your heart before God. In other words, you're still the Lord of your own life. You're doing life your way. And you recognize today that you want to surrender to him. And whether it's physically kneeling, if you can, or kneeling simply in your heart, some of you are going to recognize, I need to surrender my life completely to him. I'm pursuing him. I repent of my sins. And when you call on him, God is faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Years from now, you're going to look back and you're going to say, it was during this Christmas time that I knelt and surrendered before God and he changed my life because Jesus was born to give his life for me so I can live for him. You recognize that you're trying to control and you want to surrender him to make him your Lord and Savior of your life today. You give him your life. That's your prayer. You would lift up your hands right now and you would say, I surrender my life to Christ. Lift up your hands and say, Yes, I give my life to him. If that's you, lift up your hands. I give my life to Christ. To forgive me of my sins. To make me brand new. I surrender, I kneel. God, I want you as my Savior. And I give that to you this morning. And I pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. What a great series. Four postures of worship, raising our hands, right? Giving gifts, pouring out our hearts, crying to God, hey, we need you, God. We need you. And then this morning, shaka. What a great Hebrew word. To get down low and to kneel before our God, our Savior. Man, what a great time. Thank you for worshiping and doing Christmas with us all together.